Good afternoon. I am happy to be here. This is my first time to Slush. And today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how all the data that we talked about earlier can impact our lives and fundamentally change our economy. Now, you probably think, why does one of the largest company president here in Slush? And I can also tell you that I've been an entrepreneur. And I took my last company public, so I can relate to many of you in this room. And many of you, as some day, are going to be at the large companies as well. So it's important to recognize the innovation and great ideas come from smaller companies, but eventually you got the highest stage for creating a large platform. So let me start with this picture of Galaxy. How many of you use Galaxy? Raise your hand, please. I thank you. And um, do you know how many galaxies are there in the world? How many stars are there? It's a big number. It's 100 billion. And the number of stars are big. It's the, it's the numbers that always help us to think about the future, about the dream. It turned out. In our head, we also have 100 billion neurons that are helping us to process number of data in a parallel processing in many ways with much less power, maybe about 20 watt of power that are being able to help you turn large number of compute, comprehension, making decisions. So let me just say that even bigger number is in front of us as we are connecting all the devices. And that number is really hard to pronounce. It is a number of 30, 340 trillion, trillion, trillion. That's an IP address number. If you look at that, that's a 34 by 10 by 36. And I don't think there is any name that, re that can represent 10 to 36. But that's how big potential connectivity world is based on IP address. So what does that all mean? That means that we have a lot of data. And by the way, that has been good for our business. Our data business has been growing. So in many ways, about half of all the world data is actually getting through our storage, our memory, and that business has been growing. But you can see we are still very early stage of data explosion. Every device like Ola and others that are talking about sensing information about you, your phones, all those things combination will create even bigger data that are coming together. Now, this data is actually only tagged about 3%. Means 97% of data is actually not being tagged. And only about 0.5% of that data is analyzed. So many of you in this room, there is a huge opportunity to be able to take advantage of the resource of data that is really not driven by any manufacturing. It's intangible. But yet, you can be able to make much insight out of that. And that's the opportunity for entrepreneurs. And that's an also opportunity for us as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about what the zettabyte means. Right? Zettabyte just like, sounds like another number. But it's actually a very big number. So I tried to translate for you. I translate in Samsung terms. It turned out 160 gigabyte is 2.5 billion hours of 4K UHD movies. Or if you stack 128 gigabytes of memory in your phone, in our Galaxy S8, if you stack them up together, it will go all the way to moon and come back. That's how many we're talking about. So this data is really huge. And I think this data is really changing our economy. So this is why in my talk, I'm talking about that 21st century where we are is really data economy, just like what oil has done to our economy 20th century. So let's go back. Let's go back to 150 years ago when oil was discovered. As you know, oil wasn't actually discovered 150 years ago. Oil has been here with us for a long time. It was found in China. It was found in the Middle East. But oil was used only for very narrow applications. Only when the automobile came out, 
it changed the way that we use as an engine. The combustion engine in particular really changed the uh, airplanes, shipping, as well as automotive applications. Now, not only did things change the economy for transportation, but also it changed the much of the way we live. Think about all the byproduct of petrol, so nylon, or other things that are really helping us our lives better, or you could also argue it can pollute our lives as well. So each of these things in each process create different economy that create big economy for all of us. That is the 20th century economy. We are living in that economy. Today, I would say that we are in a new economy, a new economy that are driven by data, whether it is that generating data like Aura earlier by getting your information from your you know, the ring that gives you heart rate availability, giving you information about your movements, your sleep, all those things are really data generating activities. In fact, your phone alone will generate a lot of data that you don't even aware of, but it's happening. And then eventually, you have to curate this data. You have to make sense out of it. You have to make sure this data has certain format that makes sense. And then you want to connect this data through the cloud, because data by itself is in isolation. But when you come together, data from your home, data from your work, data from your body, data from your automotive or other devices, when you put that together, then now you can get an insight. That insight is what we are looking for. That insight can give you better info, information that can help us to live better. And then eventually, that's going to be presented to certain format that are having used by you. All those processes that we are in is an opportunity to create economy, and all of you are part of that process of generating business. So let me give you a perspective on how big is the data economy. Is it real or is it just fascination? So let me go back 10 years ago. If you look at 10 years ago, 2007, 10 largest companies in the world in valuation, half of them are oil companies. You can see ExxonMobil, you can see PetroChina, Shell, BP. And then if you look at 2017, 10 years later, 7 out of 10 companies are really data-driven companies that are taking advantage of data platform to create new economy that requires less resource by being able to create much bigger outcome out of combining experiences and combining the new capabilities. So I was looking at how big is the valuation of these companies. When, when did it transition over? It turned out until about 2013, still oil economy was much bigger than the uh, data economy. But it's about 2013 it transitioned over. Now, today, you could say some bubble in the market. But still, at the end of the day, the valuation of these platform companies, if you add the top five, it's $3 trillion, whereas the top five oil companies represent about $1 trillion. In fact, their overall market cap didn't change. It's really data economy that has really taken off. So this is why I think where we are is really data is driving new economy. We're in a new place where we're creating new opportunities. And the, um, the reason I think this is because of a certain things that are happening around us. So I call this perfect storm. I know you've seen the movie. And the, um, the point I'm trying to make it is that, number one, much of the devices are connected, hyper-connected, right? Samsung build, we make about 660 million appliances a year. Washing machine, you know, refrigerators, um, vacuum cleaners. That's about 10% of all the appliances in the world. Every one of them will be connected. So it's not just us. Everybody else is doing it. So it generates the explosion of data that are coming from many different places than that we ever imagined. And obviously, with a lot of data, we really cannot process that by our human brains. The reason AI machine is becoming important is not because AI machine is new. Machine, AI and machine learning has been around for 30 years. The reason it's becoming critical is because now we have a lot of data. With a lot of data, we can make sense out of it. And this is why the transition of AI and machine learning is happening today. 
And obviously, Helsinki, where we are in, is a very important part of the pioneer work that are going on through their great educational system. The other thing that are critical also is the end of Moore's law, or slow, slowing down of Moore's law. As you know, the transistor density doubled every 18 months. That is not happening. It's getting more expensive. So we have to figure out how to create AI and machine learning through multiple simple CPUs to perform the kind of brain power like we do with our brains. <laughs> Lastly, all these data means cybersecurity risk. So there is a huge opportunity and threat that we have to deal with. Identity management would be one of the very important issues we have to deal with in our time. But the data and mobility is really creating new businesses. So if you look at today, Uber or Lyft or the Samsung Pay, Airbnb, all these companies wouldn't be available without mobile phones, wouldn't be available without GPS, would not be available with the cloud. And this thing all happened last 10 years. Just think about 10 years ago, 2007. I used to come to Helsinki to visit Nokia. This is just before it's migrating from feature phone to smartphone. And when smartphone happened, everything changed. So in our business, really our business, we are in a very knife uh, edge business. You know, one day it looks great, the next day it could be all gone. And we have to really take advantage of the new capabilities, bring these capabilities into the phones. And that's really what's going on. But I believe the shared economy is one example of what I call optimizing uh, efficient way of resource allocation. But tomorrow, I think even bigger things can happen. And I hope all of you can help us contribute to even bigger and better world. That is, whether it's an ADAS, whether digital health, or IoT. These are things that can help us even bigger implication to mankind that are more sustainable. So let me give you some examples. So example of the technology that are in front of us is really, in many ways, biology is inspiring innovation. And also, the technology is inspiring biology. What I mean is, a lot of times when we say deep learning, it doesn't come from anywhere. It actually comes from us. It comes from all of us as sapiens and animals that has been learning. And we learn certain tricks, certain way of doing things. And at the same time, because of technology, now we can be able to sequence genetic information much faster than we could have something that would cost $100 million only 15 years ago. Now you can have $1,000 point for DNA sequencing. And prediction is it's going to be below $100 in a few years. So those information, the price point, performance, is going to change the way we live. So nobody taught this frog to eat bugs, but in their brain, it seems understands that is the uh, biology they're trained to do. Ah. Sometimes they also adopt and try to bite your hand, and that's the sound you just heard. So let me just tell you, as we're looking at how the biology is inspiring us, let's look at ourselves. I think if you look at number of cars today, there are many, many sensors that are helping us to drive better. It's not that long time ago that I have to look at oil sticks. It wasn't that long time ago I have to look at the gas mileage. It's not too long ago I have to look at tire gauges. Now with sensors, you know what's going on in your dashboard. And uh, with a phone, it has 11 sensors that knows a lot about how you're using your phones. But in our human body, there are no sensors today. I think earlier speaker talked about how the sensors can help some of our information around body. And my prediction is that we are going to have more sensors that can help. Let me give you one example of a European company that I'm personally invested. And this is a company called Broom Life. It's a Belgian company. And basically, it started with uh, one of the founder who worry about the, the what I call pregnancy uh, troubles, particularly acknowledging the uh, contraction cycles. So uh, he said, you know, how, what if, if I use the sensors to be able to decode some of these early false alarms? So in the process, he have created this company called Broom Life. And it's out of a, um, Leuven um, uh, at the uh, IMAC. 
and the uh, in interesting companies that are uh, example of how sensors can apply along with algorithms can really impact the way we live. So the other example would be how one can be able to prevent cancer. It can really change from 10% survival rate to 90% by one drop of blood, by analyzing them ahead of time and matching with certain oncology so they can be able to detect the patterns. So a lot of data, but actually start with very some small data. What's important is that having the right compute engine that can be able to analyze it and sense it and being able to process those. So let's look at the automobiles. That's another area of a huge revolution that's going on. Today, your car is maybe about 500 gigabytes of information. But tomorrow, it's going to be a lot bigger. We're talking about 50 terabytes of data in your car because of cameras, because of lidars, because of radars, because of sensors, because you're connected to 5G. You will be very much aware of where you are. In the process, your car is becoming a mini data center. And what that means is, again, huge opportunity for change in computer architecture, huge opportunity for data, also new applications that can help us live better. Because as you know, 93% of all the accidents are due to human distraction. And I can assure you, when I'm driving Tesla, my friends say it drives better than me driving it because of the way it's centered, the way it keeps certain distance. So uh, obviously, machine can help. But there are still a lot of opportunities to improve because machine versus the uh, policies have to manage so that we can be able to navigate between man versus machine uh, navigation space. At Samsung, we invest in places like this, in the area of machines, in the area of health, area of Internet of Things, and an infrastructure that can enable uh, these things. We probably spend about a billion dollars last five years investing in this type of companies to uh, enable innovation. Some of the interesting data about global data startup, it's not just in Silicon Valley. It's not just in the, uh, uh, Japan. It's actually China has been investing a lot in, this, in terms of overall economic uh, innovation, as well as in other places. I'm really good to see slush is happening with high energy and driving great entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, as well as people like us being able to exchange uh, opportunities together. So, Basically, I think the data will drive whole new opportunities, all of us in this room, whether you are in government, whether it's in education, whether it's in agriculture, mobility, and health. You know, with data, we should be able to impact our lives. And as Arbor said this morning, creating a more sustainable world. Thank you very much.